Do not think that you are set aside, for I have not set you aside, but you are pressing in more than you think. You are seeking more than you think. You are receiving more than you think. For you can see that the power of my Holy Spirit is all around you. And that you are immersed in the gift in the river of the Holy Spirit. But today, today the gift will get inside of you. The power of my Holy Spirit will get inside of you. And you will experience the river flowing. You will experience the living waters within. So you are doing better than you think you are. Oh, you are doing better. Than <laughs> you are doing better for you look around. You look around and you see the others. And you say, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? There is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you. It is just that I have recently put you in the stream. It is recently for today I have saved the finest wine for today I have saved the finest wine for today and I pour out I pour out the choice wine the choice wine the choice wine start drinking start drinking early start drinking early start drinking early for the blessings are many the blessings are many and this is not the end this is the continuation of my celebration my celebration my celebration with my children so join I free you, I free you, I free you, for I want you to know, I want you to know all the mysteries of my kingdom. I want to give you all the gifts of my Holy Spirit. I want you to experience them all. But I must free you first. I must free you. I must free you. So now I free you. I free you. I set you free. I set you free. I set you free in my glory. I set you free in my glory. Free. 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 So stirring of the Holy Spirit, but we don't receive it, or we, we don't recognize it. It's important to recognize the stirring of the Holy Spirit, and then it takes time for the Holy Spirit just to go deeper and deeper, and especially this happens at the moment of communion. Okay, at the moment of communion, and often, of course, we run outside the church. You know, some, sometimes people run outside the church right after they receive Holy Communion. Okay, so especially after Holy Communion, there's a stirring of the Holy Spirit, so just let it go deeper. Okay, often we short-circuit what God wants to do. So part of this revival 
is that you learn to receive the anointing. Josie, could you come on up? Josie, come on up. Okay. So that you can receive the anointing. Okay, so the, that's an awful point. Also, you'll notice that in our worship, okay, we just get led a little differently. It's a little quieter. It's, it's not it's quieter. Sometimes it's pandemonium, huh? And at other times, it's just a deep, and you just, so what's important here, is, you know, sometimes I say, boy, we went over there, it was a powerful night. Sure, but did you receive it? No, so that's what's important, okay? Because sometimes it can just be a gentle breeze, and if you're receiving it, it's like a powerful wind, okay? okay. Hi, my name is Josie. Um, two months ago, I had my fourth child, a uh, little girl, and um, with the other children, I had went natural, but I um, think I lost my tolerance, so I agreed to the epidural, and um, I didn't know anything about it, really, and when I was getting it, the doctor said, oh, I think we got a wet tap. I didn't know what that meant, but the next day, um, the nurse said, did he explain to you what, you know, might happen? And I said, no. And she said, well, you know, you can get some headaches and uh, backache, but, you know, sometimes it lasts long and sometimes, you know, it'll go away. So as the day went on, I was feeling, you know, pretty bad and uh, nobody was coming in and I started feeling a lot of pressure on my head and it just increased and intensified until I couldn't stand it anymore. Uh, I felt like I had literally a ton of bricks on my head and um, so they had to do a procedure of a um, what they called a uh, patch, a blood patch which they said may not work and that afternoon Sister Allison Monsignor came in and um, they prayed prayed on me for a long time and um, the doctor in the meantime was outside the door waiting to see if we should do another blood patch so um, later the nurse came in and said, you know, the doctor came back, but your priest was in there. And she just sort of looked at me kind of funny. And um, so uh, that night, you know, Monsignor prayed on me, with me on the phone, and um, my husband and I continued to pray, and um, Monsignor made up a tape of um, prayer tongue, which he sent to me that weekend. And I uh, listened to it when I came home. They sent me home with like five uh, refills for Tylenol with codeine and said, you know, you might be better in about five months. So um, in the meantime, that week, I kept on playing the prayer tape. I would go to bed at night and say, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't even pray myself. I would just put the tape on. And um, that Friday, which was the um, Feast of the Sacred Heart, I said, Jesus, please lift this from me. I said, and I put the tape on, and I fell asleep. Well, Saturday, um, all the pressure in my head was gone. Um, a lot of people here had called me up and prayed with me. I, I felt really at one with people from here, from Revival. And by Sunday, which was about a week and a half later, you know, I felt 90% better. And then um, within a day or two, everything was gone. And I, I thank God. So, um, I continue to use the tape, and I even use it for my daughter. Uh, when she doesn't sleep at night, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'll put the, the tape on. And my husband says, was my senior here last night? <laughs> but. Um, and she seems to enjoy it too because she was with me every Wednesday night um, before she was born. She was here with me, so I think she knows it. John chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me. Let him drink who believes in me. For scripture has it, from within him rivers of living water shall flow. Here he was referring to the spirit whom those that came to believe in him were to receive. There was, of course, no spirit as yet, 
since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This final talk explains how every revival has a prehistory, something that went before, and every revival has a goal, some purpose of God, some plan that God has in store for his church. The title of this talk is that all, every revival has a prehistory as well as a goal. And so we're going to start off with the idea of move of God. It's a new term for Catholics. It's something that is common in Pentecostal circles. And for oftentimes when I got into charismatic renewal and especially when I would join in any Protestant services, they would talk about a revival coming. This would be in the 70s. And they, could, they said the revival is coming, the revival is coming, there's going to be a powerful move of God. However, there were some false ideas about revival uh, because anything that you don't experience, you have a false idea, the same way with tongues. Before we began to experience tongues, uh, the teaching on tongues was uh, part of the church's teaching or in the spiritual writers is that it's a mystical gift and that, uh, you know, when the saint is, is caught up in contemplation that they couldn't uh, express it in English or in the vernacular, so God would then give them this ecstatic teaching, ecstatic uh, prayer, okay? And of course, when that was the false idea of tongues. It's not ecstatic. It's something that God gives, and it isn't just to the saint caught up in contemplation, but it's really for every, it's a gift of baptism. So when we, tongues came, then we got a true idea of what they were, and it is the same with revival. So before revival actually came, there was a couple, number of false ideas. The idea was that this was a sovereign act of God, namely, the, and, it's, and also people thought that it, what it was is that this act of God started out in the world and people who knew nothing about God were suddenly being touched by God and then they were jumping into the churches. And one author says that when revival comes, the, the, you don't have to fish because the fish start jumping into the boat, okay? You just sit there in a the boat. And they, now, now, that is true. But that's not where revival starts. So the idea was that this is an act of God that starts somewhere out there. Also, there's the idea that it's a sovereign act of God. Well, revival is a sovereign act of God. You cannot start revival. I, I know there have been instances where people said, let's have revival. And the, in good faith and good will, they said, come on, if we get together every single night, every night and every night, and God will give us revival. And of course, they got together, but God wasn't ready to start revival in their midst, okay, for his own reason. So we cannot start revival. No one can start revival. But it's not a sovereign act of God in the sense that we just sit back. And that's where today we're going to talk about the prehistory. And you can see so that hopefully as this talk is happening, you will begin to see in your own situation what God has already done, and you'll get a sense of the next step. So, that every, so the first wrong idea is that somehow it's a sovereign act of God that we just sit back and wait for it to happen. On the other hand, it also was a sovereign act of God in the thought that once revival started, you know, it, God's just going to do it, okay? And revival always had its effects, and of course that's not true at all. As we study revival, we re realize that often God starts revival and then some the people oppose revival or even the people who are in revival misuse it. They misuse it for their own good, their selfish agenda. They, they see opportunities for their own glory. Okay? When, when, okay, when there is, this is what Catherine Coleman starts her talks out with. God will give his glory to no one. God will not share his glory in the sense of who gets the glory. He will share it with everyone. He will share it with his children. But he will not share that, that glory in the sense, he will not, Catherine Coleman starts off, he will not share his glory with anyone in the sense of that if people, if people who are experiencing revival start taking the glory to themselves, then God just stops. He stops, okay? So that people in revival can be the, the main opponent of revival if they're selfish and make it their own agenda. So that the second false idea is that revival just sort of, you know, it's a sovereign act of God and it's going to work. And the answer, that's not true at all. We have to constantly be walking in the, in the God's light and in purity of intention. So neither of those is, is true. Now what re this is what revival is. Revival is a move of God. That move of God always starts in the church. He want, revival is primarily for the church. 
and it stirs up the church to be the church, to be what God calls us to be. If the church gets back its enthusiasm, okay, then what begins to happen is the numbers begin to come, and the length of time that they come together extends, and there's joy and there's enthusiasm, okay, so much so that then it, the church is begin to impact others, and others then begin, to, so it is true. Revival, all of a sudden, people start showing up at church that you never thought would ever darken the inside of the church, okay? With Jonathan Edwards, he was preaching, and he broke out, revival broke out. It was when a group of, of girls, okay, uh, sort of girls that walked on the wild side. Now, I don't know how wild it could have been in Jonathan Edwards' time, okay? But some girls that walked on the, on the wild side they got touched, they came to church. When they showed up at church, it touched off a, a nationwide revival, okay? That, that these, these girls would ever come to church. The whole town was in astound, astounded, okay? And then revival, the, the first, what we call Great Awakening happened. And the, so, but then the real, the real part of revival is that the whole culture is shaken. There is a whole culture, the whole culture. And that's what happened in the Great Awakenings. The whole United States got shaken. I think it was in the First Awakening, one out of every three Americans got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the First Awakening. And what it really did, it got us ready for the Revolutionary War. Another great revival got us ready for the Civil War. It was the great revival that started to say slavery is not, is not right. Okay? So that God always has a goal for revival. And, there, and when... Uh, and when uh, the preachers would come to town, then everything would close down. Okay? There, uh, now, now, there's been a study by Richard Reese that shows, it called the, the 19th and 20th century revivals in North America, and this is his findings. Okay? Uh, first, first of all, there were 30 things he listed for revival, and I listed them for the priest prayer group, and Bill Gaffney began to say, I see all 30 of them happening. He uh, goes around, he's in New York, he does missions there in New York, Okay, he says, I see all 30 of those happening, these 30 signs of revival, okay, that are taking place. Okay. But what Reese says is this, that as he looks at the revivals in the 19th and 20th century America, the phenomena, the power of the Holy Spirit is greater in the 20th century revivals. But the 20th century revivals have not had the impact upon America that the 19th century revivals had. And he said the reason is, is because the secularization of America, that America takes religion and puts it in the margin. That if you're religious, okay, you move your desk over to the window. Okay, oh, you're, you're involved with God. Well, okay, wait a minute, your desk, we now moved your desk over to the window. Okay, we're not going to let you in the mainstream. There is ter terrible compartmentalization of religion. America has marginalized religion. That never happened in the 19th century. When the preacher would come to town, the shops would close down and the crowds would be gigantic. Okay? So, but let's not take, you know, let's not be disheartened by it because God is just going to keep up in the ante. So what is happening in this revival is that there are gifts and powers of God that are greater than, than ever before. Okay? Now, the, now the problem is that it's not having the impact upon the society, but it will. I just read last night in Pensacola, it's documented in Pensacola, Florida, that the crime rate is down. That, it, that, that's now, that that is now at a level. They get 5,000 people a night, four, four nights a week, okay, waiting, lining up at 3, 3 p.m. in the afternoon to get into a 7 p.m. service. And I think they have a 2,500-seat church and a 2,500-seat overflow. Okay, and they're full every night, and they start like at 7 o'clock, and then the service winds down, and then they, the people stay around to about 1 or 2 in the morning. Okay. Okay. But it has impacted the city, and, and the crime rate is down, it says, in, in charisma, the latest charisma. So, so that's what a revival is meant to do. Namely, it's meant to impact the whole culture. God wants to shake a nation. And that's why we, we can't split up revival. We can't say, okay, now let's start going here, going there, because God, the secret of revival is to stay together, okay, like atomic nuclear fission. You know, you just stay together until the power builds up and it goes boom, okay? And that's, and God, that's why this revival has to be God's. It's his plan. We don't, people say, what's the future of, of uh, a revival at presentation, or what's the future of revival in the Catholic Church? I don't know the future. I don't know if you, because God has his plan. I don't know the, the plan of revival. 
okay, but, but I know we're just meant, we'll just do what he wants and just keep coming together. Let, and you, you've been here, you know, you've seen the revival now. The, this is our third, third, uh, third morning session. It's, uh, we've finished, this is our sixth of seven sessions. You've seen the power here. Okay, we'll just stay here until, until the atomic bomb explodes here at presentation and, the, and then things get shaken. Okay, I don't know. So I'm just sitting here in the middle of the nuclear power of the Holy Spirit, okay? And let the atomic, let, let the atomic bomb just go off. Okay? I didn't, I didn't plant this bomb. This is all good. Let the bomb go off. But what I want to do first of all is talk to you about a move of God and uh, how, uh, look at Scripture. And I want to look at three, quickly, three moves of God in the Old Testament so you get the idea of what I'm talking about and it's with these biblical images. As you realize, the whole Bible is filled with moves of God. See, the Bible does not say what I can do. The Bible doesn't say what you can do. The Bible doesn't say what you and I can do together. The Bible doesn't say, get together, boys, and you can do it. The Bible doesn't say, we can do it. The Bible says, God's going to do it. That's what it says. It says, God is going to do it. That's what it says. If you read the Bible, it says one thing. God is going to do it. Okay? And that's what, we, that's what we're all about, is God doing it. Okay? And if, if God's not doing it, then let's go fishing because we're wasting our time on, on human effort. Okay? What are we doing? Okay? So there's, there's three quick moves of God I'm going to talk about and get into this. Egypt, Jews in slavery, Moses, run out of town okay, by his own people because, you know, he killed the Egyptian soldier. And then he realized that the word had spread and his life was in danger. So he goes out and, you know, gets a wife out there. And then the burning bush. I am who am. Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. As you look at that, it's a move of God. And it was successful because Moses realized he didn't know what he was doing. Okay? That's the... Moses realized he didn't know what he was doing. He also realized he wasn't a good speaker. He told that God, I'm not a good speaker. God says, okay, I'll give you Aaron. Don't worry. Okay. Moses didn't know what he was doing. He, didn't, he couldn't speak. And so he was the perfect instrument. Okay. A perfect. You know, sometimes we look at people and say, oh, if I only had their intelligence. Okay. If you had their intelligence, you, you'd be out of, out, of, out of kilter. Okay. You got the exact amount of intelligence that you can handle. Okay. <laughs> right. 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 Okay, that's it. You're, okay. Any more electricity up in that head of yours, and it would go boom. Right? Okay. So, look at your talents and say you're perfect. Okay. You are perfect. You are perfect. Just the amount of intelligence God wants you to have. Just the amount of talents that He didn't give you less. He didn't give you more. So you are perfect. Okay. And Moses was perfect for the job, and he was perfect because. He knew he couldn't speak, and he knew he didn't know what to do. So as you look at it, any time there was a question, he went to God. God, what do I do now? Okay? And God said, go to Pharaoh, do this. Okay, he goes over to Pharaoh. And there is this tremendous mystery that this Moses, who got thrown out of town by his own Israelites, said, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to kill one of us too in that fight? As he started to separate them. As he ran out of town, this Moses who got ran out of town was able to talk these thousands of people who had been 400 years in Egypt to leaving and going out into the desert. Now, if anybody thought ahead of time, the sane, the sane Israelites stayed in Egypt, right? Because the, the, somebody, you know, did anybody ever say to Moses, Moses, you know, out in that desert there's a Red Sea. Now, now, Moses, you got it figured out for us? How are we going to get across the Red Sea? I, don't, I wonder if anybody ever asked them that question. And if somebody did, they'd say, hey, he doesn't have a plan. I'm staying in Egypt. Okay? So here is a move of God that, in a sense, is 100% successful. Everybody, it says, leaves. They did what Moses said. They took the, uh, the jewelry of the Egyptians. They had the Passover meal. They got ready. Off they went. Amazing that you got people to uproot themselves after 400 years to go out into a desert following a man 
who, who they threw out of town, who was not a natural leader. He was not a natural leader. He was just a leader appointed by God. And so what you have is a successful move of God. However, they get out into the desert. They're doing real well. They're making progress. And God says, okay, it's time to go to the promised land. Take a scout from each of the 12 tribes. And so Moses did, as always, what God wanted. Took the 12 tribes. Send them over. Send them into the promised land. Tell them to go 40 days and explore the land and come back. Okay? That's what they did. Went. They found this wonderful fruit. Everything that God had said to them, it's a, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. You got everything. And Caleb comes back and says, it's a wonderful land. It's time to move into the promised land. The other 11 came back and said, wait a minute. I got, that's the good news. Now, the bad news, I got to tell you, is it's a land of giants. Okay? And it says they began to get the people murmuring against God. And they murmured. And God said to Moses, okay, I'm finished with this people. Turn around. They will march one year for each day. I sent Caleb and the other 11 into the promised land for 40 days. Then turn around. I am going to have them go 40 years. Now, you know, you don't have to spend, you know, you, we know the maps. You know, you see it all the time. Egypt, Israel, you can get through that desert and then, you know, a couple of days. How can you spend 40 years in a desert when you can get there? You know, you know the map. Egypt, Israel's here and Egypt's down here. It's not that big a territory. Okay? 40 years. Okay? They missed the move of God. That when the moment came when they could go into the promised land, when God had given them the promised land, when God was telling them to go into the promised land, they began to murmur. If you miss the move of God, then there's a little saying in Scripture, in, in Shakespeare. I, I can't ever quote it, and when I try to quote it, people write it down for me, and I write it, and I lose it. And it's in, it's in Julius Caesar, and it's this little line by Brutus that says, there is a time and a tide in the affairs of men. And at times the, t the tide comes very, very high and powerful. And if a man catches that tide, then they are carried on. But if the, they miss the tide, then they are doomed to spend their time in shallow waters. And Buddha said, I think it is that time that we are in. And that is my message to you, and that is my message to the Roman Catholic Church. We are at the beginning of a move of God. We are at the beginning of the most powerful move of God in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. We are at the beginning of a move of God that is worldwide, that the signs and wonders are breaking out all over. We are at the beginning of the tide that is the greatest move of God since Jesus Christ walked on this earth and since there were the 40 days of visions. And I will say that clearly. We are at the beginning of the greatest move of God since Jesus Christ walked this earth and there were the 40 days of visions which unleashed the first Pentecost. For every revival is always just plugging in to the first Pentecost. And what we are at the beginning of is the greatest move of God in the history of Christianity. And I don't want the Catholic Church to miss move of God. Okay. Now, and I'm, going to, I'm going to talk now about every move of God has a prehistory, and then I'm going to show you the anointing that is upon Presentation BVM Parish. This is an anointed place. 
it is no mistake, and you'll see clearly, it is no mistake that this is where God has placed the revival fires in the Catholic Church. It's not a mistake. And as you see our prehistory and all that went ahead, you will see it is not a mistake that God has chosen Presentation BVM Catholic Church as the place for the revival fires in the Catholic Church and the place to ignite the fire in the whole Roman Catholic Church. Okay. First of all, ev every, every move of God has a prehistory. And I, I want to start with what we're involved in, of course, is Pentecostalism. Well, Pentecostalism had a prehistory. We, we, Pentecostalism had a very, very clear beginning, modern Pentecostalism. We mentioned Pope Leo XIII, the prayer, uh, December 31st, 1900. Uh, we mentioned Parham, the Topeka, Kansas, the Bible College. All historians say that, that, every, that all modern Pentecostalism flows from Parham and Seymour. Seymour goes out to Azusa Street in 1906, a disciple of Parham. And okay, so that, that started, that really is the beginning of modern Pentecostalism. But there was a whole prehistory. The whole 19th century was really the Methodist century uh, in three ways. The Methodist church itself grew with tremendous growth. Secondly, other churches that were sort of in that Methodist stream were really touched by God. And third, there was a whole Methodist spirituality, which if even the church itself was not Methodist or not in the Methodist stream, it was still affected by Methodist spirituality. Now, John Wesley is the founder of Methodism, and it's called Methodism because he had a method. And the method was to bring people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, although they didn't have that term. That term first began to be appear in books in 1875. But the, the, the experiences and the idea that you would have a religious experience and the idea that, that after your baptism you should search for your own Pentecost or search, all that is 19th century spirituality. Okay. But not only that, but within the Methodist Church itself, there God raised up another movement because they saw that the Methodist Church itself needed revival. And so there was, in the, in the second half of the 19th century, especially toward the end of the 19th century, a movement called the, the, holiness, the holiness Movement, which the, the complete title is, is a gigantic, I don't even remember it myself, but basically it was camp meetings for the promotion of holiness in the church. Okay? And that's where we get the camp meetings. And so there were these camp meetings and literally the camp meetings, and it was a renewal movement, and they, there they really began to get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The book started to appear, Baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this whole movement was all said. They had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What they didn't have was praying in tongues. So they had, in the latter part of the 19th century, you had this tremendous renewal movement called the Holiness Movement. Okay? And, and, and then it began to become holiness churches, which are still around today, the holiness churches. Okay. What happened then, Parham was at a holiness camp up in New England, and he was a seeker. He, he was going, trying to find the power of God. And he was up in the New England at a holiness camp, and there he heard about praying in tongues. Missionaries were coming back, from, and they were saying that they were experiencing tongues. Parham misinterpreted this whole thing and thought it was an evangelization gift and obviously, this was the final harvest, because praying in tongues was emerging again. So that's when he went back to his little Bible school and said, please, let's start looking at this gift of praying in tongues. So they began to read the Acts of the Apostles. He said, look and see in the Acts of the Apostles, what don't we do? And they're looking in the Acts of the Apostles, and that's where they discover laying on of hands. They said, we don't lay hands. So they said, well, let's start laying hands. So they started laying hands, and as they started laying hands, then they began to pray in tongues. Parham, as one who searched, you can see the dynamic happening over again. Parham, as he searched, he found something. And once somebody searches and finds something, they're not going to let go of it. And he didn't let go of it. So he then became the apostle of Pentecost. And he goes around, he touches Seymour. Seymour goes out to Azusa Street. But where Parham goes is to all the holiness groups. So you already had all these holiness churches and the holiness movement, and you had a great big gigantic 10,000 Zion city in, founded by John Dewey in Chicago. He goes there. What happened is 
within a short time, all the holiness churches became Pentecostal. They, they bought in to the gift of tongues and the, the baptism of the Spirit and how you're sure you're receiving the baptism of the Spirit where you got the praying in tongues. And so what you had is modern Pentecostalism with a tremendous beginning, but you can see that there was a preparation, that there's a prehistory, there is a prehistory, and the people who are involved in the prehistory don't even know why they're involved in the prehistory, but they're just involved in it. They'd have no idea of the gift that's coming in revival. Revival, in a sense, is always a surprise because it's new, but at the same time, you have people looking and searching for it. The same thing happened with charismatic renewal. It was preceded by the Corsuglio movement. The Corsuglio movement, as you look at it, obviously, they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They might not even known the name for it, but they were spending weekends bringing people into an experience of Jesus. They didn't realize that the Pentecostals had a name for it called Baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they also didn't realize that you could pray in tongues, or that praying in tongues should come. So that the, Car the Casulio movement was the preparation for charismatic renewal. And when charismatic renewal hit, and it hit Duquesne, as I mentioned the other day, it hit Duquesne, but then immediately it found the Corsuglio stream. So because there were already this network of people in Corsuglio who were already interested in Jesus and already interested in experiencing Jesus as your personal Lord, it hit that stream and that's where it went. And that's why Notre Dame and Ann Arbor became the center of the renewal, okay, because there were people there who were in Corsuglio. They already had the network built. And you could see the Corsuglio was really a preparation for charismatic renewal, okay? okay so now, I don't know, something that I don't want to say, okay? Now, what I want to try to do is to show you uh, just what preparation took place for this revival breaking out here at presentation. 1971, okay, I got involved with Brother Pankey. We started, I was with him. We started our prayer groups. And um, in September 19, August 1971, Sister Alice went to Brother Panky. She had gotten in the movement in 1970 and said, Brother, you know, we really need a prayer group for sisters. And St. Boniface is nice, but it's 9 o'clock at night to 11 o'clock, and, you know, it's difficult for sisters, and probably Saturday night would be better. And he said, well, why don't you go to Father Walsh? And so Sister was on the sixth floor working in the Catholic, uh, relig Catholic school's office. I was on the twelfth floor in priest personnel. So sister comes up and sits there and says, Father, Brother Panky sent me here, and could you, uh, we want to start a prayer group for sisters, would you come over to Murrian? Murrian is about three, about two, about a mile away from here, a few minutes away from here. It is the mother house of the Mercy Sisters, uh, the Murrian Mercies, they're called. Okay, so Saturday night, September 1971, I show up. Sister has about one or two other professed sisters and about four three or four or five uh, novices who had been involved in renewal, and so there we were, six or seven of us, sitting around. Okay. As we were sitting around, uh, the telephone rang, and Sister Alice had to leave the room because she was called you know, to take the telephone. Someone opened the, the Bible to the reading that we opened with, John's Gospel, okay, the Living Waters Gospel. And of course, it says at the end that Jesus says the Living Waters would be given, because there was no spirit as yet, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And say, hey, that fits us. It's our first night, you know, we're not sure we're supposed to have the meeting. This sort of just coming together to see what the Lord wants. That really fits us. There's no spirit given yet. That's our gospel. About 15 minutes later in the meeting, Sister Alice starts reading the same reading. I turned, I said, Sister, we had that reading. Oh, she said, I was out at the telephone. Okay, I didn't realize, of course, she had come in, played scriptural roulette, and of course got open to the exact same reading. So we knew that we were Murrayan living waters. We went over, we, we then kept growing, and sisters kept coming. And we were, we were small because we were limited to sisters only at that time. And it was 1972, it was the Vigil of Pentecost, and we were going to have our first day of recollection, the day of recollection, and it was ordination day. So I went down to the cathedral for ordination where you had the, 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 or, you know, the, the big church and the beautiful ordination ceremony, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that has its own tremendous joy. Okay. 
Usually after that, you know, you would go to one of the breakfasts of one of the priests, but I, I, I turned all those invitations down because we were going to have our day around. And I still remember getting in the car, and what a great sense of God's peace. I was just leaving a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. But I was also going out to just a little group that no one would think much about. Just about 15, 20 sisters. We were going to have our day of renewal. The tremendous peace that was upon me. At the end of the day, it was the Vigil of Pentecost. We got ready for our liturgy. We opened the lectionary, and there are readings A, B, and C for the first two readings. But when you come to the gospel, and we really rejoice, A, B, and C, there's only one gospel for the Vigil of Pentecost, the living water gospel. Okay, That's okay. John 7. Look, it's still, if you have the vigil, it's there. A, B, and C. And so we rejoice. We say, hey, the Lord's really doing something here. We kept going. There, there was a tremendous quality of prayer there. And then um, one night, a laywoman showed up, and I had been over to a neighboring parish to give a talk on baptism spirit, and during the, well, during the talk, she and her, her, her friend her, who were there, they both got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what happened. They had to call me back and say, something happened to us, Father. We went back. I said, what happened to you? You both got baptized in the Holy Spirit while I was talking. You just, you know, during the question and answer period to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so she showed up at the meeting. With that, we said, look, let's open it up to everyone. So we did, and the group grew, and the group grew, and grew, and it got to hundreds and hundreds until we were filling the gymnasium. There were over 400 people every Saturday night. So, so much so that by August 19, and so it was what we called Murrian Living Waters. And then, and it was a tremendous Saturday night, beautiful Saturday night, cars all over the place, people all over the place. The prayer was deep, the powers were deep. We were learning many things. Murray and Living Waters. And then August 1976, we realized that we had to close because they couldn't handle the parking. And what happened then, the people went back and they began their own, their own prayer groups. Okay? The Lord told us, though, that there would always be a Living Waters prayer group. And there would always be a Murray and Living Waters, even though it was closed down. My own history was this. In 1967, I came here to presentation in residence. I, was, I had just come back from Rome. I had just gotten my doctorate in canon law, and I was assigned to teaching in a Catholic high school, senior religion, and because the, this was one of the parishes where priests lived in residence. So I was here from 67 to 68. After 68, uh, Cardinal Kroll named me to the personnel office, the chancery in Philadelphia, and asked me to live with him. So I lived with Cardinal Kroll for eight years. Okay? I got to know him very well, wonderful, wonderful man, just a wonderful man. I lived with him for eight years. And then uh, when there was, uh, I was then uh, he named me Episcopal Vicar for the, for the charismatic prayer groups and also asked me to join the staff of the tribunal. With that, I had to relocate. And lo and behold, the last place I thought I would come back to his presentation. Never thought I would return. But as I began to look, because I was in priest personnel, I could pick my own thing, I began to look through all the parishes, you know, where do I want to live? I thought the only, the only place that's left open is, is, is presentation, and here I am coming back. So 76, 1976, I came back here for four years. 19, 1978, I would come over here and make my holy hour. I was sitting in the first pew, making my holy hour, and the Lord said, started speaking. He said, Vincent, I will put you in a very special place. I said, Lord, you can put me anywhere. You know you can put me anywhere. And then he like knocked me for a loop. He said, I'm going to put you right here, right here. Okay. Now that was the furthest thing from my mind. Father O'Connor, the founding pastor, was going to retire the next year, but I knew I was too young to be named pastor. I thought, gee, how am I going to be put here? Well, the Lord said, I'm going to put you here. I put it out of my mind. Didn't even think about it. Okay. In 1980, I actually was changed in residence, continued working at the diocese, but was moved to another parish and then to another parish. And it was only in 1990 when the things just came together, and suddenly the, the, the second pastor, Monsignor Cavanaugh, was going to retire. We had a priest 
luncheon, a prayer luncheon, over at the Williamson's restaurant. I'm there with the priest, and Monsignor happened to be there. He goes there for lunch. He said to me, well, I sent in my letter of resignation. I'm retiring. Didn't mean a thing to me. Oh, that's nice, you know. Two weeks later, the Lord starts talking to me. He says, I told you I wanted you to go to that parish. I said, that's right. He said, write to the cardinal and tell him that you offer your name as pastor of presentation. And that's what I did. Okay? Sent the letter. Next day, clergy office calls up, says you're the pastor. No, okay? No, no, okay. Now, there's something else happened, because in 1981, we were out at Malvern when the, um, I was hosting the Diocese and Liaison Convention, and that was the day the Pope got shot, May 13, 1981. And the, the day before, Father O'Connor, the pastor, had died. I didn't know that, and I got a call from Chancery on May 13th, and, and I went in to you know, to call them, and they said, Father O'Connor died, would you be the homilist at his funeral? I said, fine. I come out of the, out of the door, Sister Peggy, who's now in the supine position over here, <laughs> Sister Peggy was, was playing the uh, music, for the, and she, she was stationed here, and she said, uh, what was the call about? Oh, I said, I had to realize that about an hour before we had announced to all the priests that the Pope had been shot, that's all we knew. Pope had been shot. I come out, I say to Sister Peggy, uh, what was she said, what was the phone call about? Oh, I said, it's about Father O'Connor, because she knew him. He just died. Well, the priest walking by heard the words, he just died. Okay. With that, they turned around in complete shock, thinking it was the Pope, and I said, oh no, not the Pope, just Father O'Connor. <laughs> And of course, that was the opening story for the homily on Father O'Connor's funeral. What happened was, they, they shifted the days for me to come in and see the Cardinal. And I ended up going in to see Cardinal Bevilacqua on the ninth anniversary of the death, May 12, 1990, the anniversary. That you, I can't tell you the feelings when I woke up that day and realized that, that the prophecy of 1978 was going to be fulfilled and also that I was going in to get named to this parish on the anniversary of this priest who I loved, who I was with a couple of times, and on his anniversary, I was going to be named here to presentation. Now, when I came here to presentation, I, because becoming a pastor, I had to step down from all the charismatic prayer groups. However, there were seven groups, different groups that I led personally, the priest group, the, the, the uh, women's prayer luncheon, the men's prayer luncheon, the young adult group that had begun. Okay. There were five or six groups that, we, that were here. They sort of came with me here to, here to presentation. Okay. As you know, uh, things in charismatic renewal were dying down. Other people were still trying to be faithful, still holding on, but there were no more newcomers. People were getting discouraged. The prayer groups were shrinking. And I shared with them the same feeling. Wasn't charismatic renewal about the Holy Spirit? Wasn't it about the works of the Holy Spirit? What greater power could there be? So we were really at the dead end. We had the Holy Spirit. We, we prayed in tongues. And here, the very movement of the Holy Spirit was dying down. But the Lord started to talk to us. He said, I will send you another wind of the Holy Spirit. All that I ask you to do is keep up the sails of your boats. Because if you do not keep up the sails of your boats, then when the wind comes, you will not be ready. You cannot put your sail up when the wind of the Holy Spirit starts blowing. And I tell you, there will be a new, he said this to us for three years, I tell you, there will be a new wind of the Holy Spirit. Just keep your little boats, keep your sailboats. And so we did. We had a we had, our, we had our men's group, we had our women's group, we, had our, we started a young married couples, we started a first Sunday mass, 
we began a, a, a parish prayer group. So actually there were seven or eight different charismatic groups centered here in the parish. Okay? Another thing started to happen. The Lord, Lord said, you don't realize it, but this is Murrayan Living Waters. This parish, I told you, Murrayan Living Waters would always exist even after the prayer group closed. And this is Murrayan Living Waters. Okay, that's all. Okay, now. Right. Okay. Now, about, about a year and a half ago, the, the rectory building, the rectory was built around 1925, 1926. We were going to do some renovations there, and I had to get out the original plans of 1925, 1926, okay, to look at things. You know the address here as Wynwood. I wrote for your conference, Wynwood, Pennsylvania. I got out the plans, the 1925 plans, and big as life, at the bottom of the plans of where the rectory was, is the original mailing address of 204 Haverford Road. The original mailing address is Murrian Lakes, Pennsylvania. And I asked the, the next door, 202, there's a woman whose, whose father built these houses. And I said, Dottie, I said, Mur oh, she said, yeah, there, all, there were lakes right across Haverford Road there. This was Murrayan Lakes. That was our mailing address, Murrayan Lakes. So literally, the Lord fulfilled that this is Murrayan Lakes, Murrayan living waters that are flowing here, right? A another thing that, okay, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Another thing that started to happen was that a priest in 1985 put on my desk Charisma magazine. And um, he said, did you ever see this? And I said, no, I didn't. This is something. And I looked at it, and wow, I thought, this is really something. Because here in Philadelphia, the charismatic re renewal movement was obviously the strongest movement, not only in the Catholic Church, but outside the Catholic Church. Um, the uh, Protestant Pentecostals had organized a, a conference. I spoke at it in 1973. They organized another conference in 1974. It was smaller, and that was really the end. So I did not see Protest strong Protestant Pentecostalism here in Philadelphia. The, so that the charismatic renewal within the Catholic Church was also the strongest expression of Pentecostalism in Philadelphia. So, but now, as I got charisma, I began to see what I, the window to the world of, of Pentecostalism. And I began to see these various ministries. I began to see the conferences. Uh, I began to order the videos. And, and then, at our, as always, at our priest prayer group, each week I would begin to talk about these things as a teaching. And then I realized that these priests, Catholic priests, who are involved in charismatic renewal, they did not know anything of what was going on in Protestant Pentecostalism. Okay. Then it came to me, it dawned on me, it dawned on me that, that, uh, that if they don't know anything about Protestant Pentecostalism, then probably the whole Catholic Church doesn't know anything about Protestant Pentecostalism. So that's where I wrote the book, What's Going On? Okay, so I thought I've got to put this in a book, which I did, and called the book called What's Going On? that came out in around 19, 1995, right after revival broke out. So this charisma began to show me that outside of this, of this renewal, the charismatic renewal, outside there was a tremendous plan, and I thought, I've got to go find those places. But nothing worked out. Nothing worked out. I did, one summer I wanted to go to hear Peter Jungren, didn't work out. Another summer I wanted to go hear Reinhard Bonnke, nothing worked out. And that's how we ended up in Louisville. That's the first time that it worked out. And so when the three of us went down to Louisville in 1994, we had really been searching for years and looking, and then as, as we signed up for Louisville, then it began to come out about this laughter. It began to hit the various news. Uh, Charisma made Rodney Brown the, fir the front page article. And so the three of us down there, Sister Alice and her father Jim Fallon, and we felt like kids in a forbidden circus. It was the first time <laughs> I was ever, okay, first time that I was ever at this, uh, at, at a Protestant evangelism. Okay, we were there, we were like, you know, kids there, wow, we're in the circus, you know, and, okay. And uh, there were three things that took place. The first was to see the phenomena. Okay, now we had been used to charismatic phenomena, but to see, to see the laughter break out. 
to see the Dormition. And then the most startling was on Tuesday night of that conference, Rodney called about 10 ministers up, Richard Roberts from the ORU, or Oral Roberts University, the Happy Hunters, and others, Rick Shelton from St. Louis. And he, they had them standing over there, and of course, he, so he would call one of them over. And they would come over, and as they would, soon as they hit the mic, they'd get drunk in the Holy Spirit. They couldn't talk. They just couldn't. Of course, they had the big screen, and we'd watch, and there was laughter. It went on. Okay, bingo. They would go down on the floor. Then the next one would come over, and as they stand thinking they're going to start talking, and they, they can't talk. Okay. It was the most powerful, one of the most powerful nights I've ever seen in revival. He would call people up to minister like a, a musician. As soon as they got on the stage, they, they couldn't move. It was as if the Holy Spirit had just descended upon the stage. And whoever, whoever got, came upon the stage got so hit with the Holy Spirit, they, they, get, they all would get drunk in the Spirit or they couldn't move. And then after about an hour of this, which was, you know, the audience was in, we had the greatest laughter. I didn't have holy laughter, but I had a lot of natural laughter that night. The whole audience, about 5,000 people, they were all in stitches. And finally, Rodney, of course, is through all this, he's, he's in good order. He then comes and he gets drunk. He can't, he can't do anything for about a half hour. Uh, he can't do anything for about a half hour except stand there, once in a while blurt something out, okay? And, but what did you do? We just stayed in the anointing, okay? So what I saw were phenomena. Secondly, there was excellent teaching. Because Rodney in the morning sessions talked about the, the powers of revival. He talked about his, his own, the cost of revival. Okay, it's a five-part series, okay? And he was giving excellent teaching. Okay? And what he was saying was that there is this revival happening, and God is offering it to the churches. But if the churches don't take it, then he's going to offer it to other churches. And if other churches don't take it, then he's going to just offer it to whoever wants to take it because he wants to pour out his Holy Spirit. Okay? So there was excellent teaching. The third thing he said was, take the anointing. He said, this, 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 and this, now I've, I've been to other ministries since, I've listened to others, but I've never heard uh, any minister say, look, the anointing that is upon me, take. That was what was new, and that's what I'm saying to you. This, take the anointing. Because what he said is God is pouring out his Holy Spirit, and one vessel is not enough to contain this anointing. One vessel is not, is not you are each an earthen vessel. So he said, take the anointing, take. He said, take it back. And on, we only were able to be there three nights, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And on Wednesday night, as the, the other, I had to go get the car, I had to go this way to the parking lot, the other two went, went there. As they went their way, I did a U-turn, I came, and I sat in the first row. I said, Lord, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit that has been upon this stage that I have seen here for these three nights and three mornings. Let me receive the anointing for the Roman Catholic Church. Hallelujah. 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 Because, because for nine years now, I've been reading about the power of the Holy Spirit outside the Catholic Church. And I've been reading about Pentecostal evangelism. I've been reading about signs and wonders and miracles. And now I'm here at this conference and I see easily the greatest move of God that's going on. Okay. So, so let's, could I please take it for the Roman Catholic Church? Okay, and that's when we came back and None of us had any manifestations. We, you know, we enjoyed it. We asked for the gift. Came back, showed the video in the convent. Two sisters started right away into holy laughter. Two other sisters. Okay? And then, of course, the anointing tongue came, and then the revival came in October of 1994, and we no longer were in a prehistory of revival. So what we have now is a three-year history. This is our first conference, and I say the same thing to you. Take the anointing. Just take the anointing, okay? You're going to take it. You're going to, honest, you've been wonderful. You've been faithful, okay? Just take the anointing. It's yours. Don't say, well, I got there. Whether you got laughed or not, that's all right. It'll break out. So just take the anointing. Just take it now. I want to 
end with the goal of revival because the goal of revival is not revival. Okay, revival is only God stirring at this point. Okay, now I, I want to share with you the goal of revival, right. and I'm going to I'm going to at the end talk about Mary and what's happening in the Marian apparitions. Now, if you want two worlds that seem eons apart, okay, it's Marian apparitions and revival. Okay. okay, And yet, as a Catholic priest involved in revival, I'm not an expert in Marian apparitions, but I've done a lot of reading, you know, just to say as much as I can. I'm not Rene Larentin or anybody with Rene about the Marian apparitions. But I'm saying to myself, they're both saying the same thing. Hallelujah. They're both saying the same thing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In 1995, we went down to Orlando. Orlando was the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Convention together with the others. Now, every few years they do one with all the Protestant groups, all the Pentecostal groups. It's an ecumenically run thing with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal there. I think about a third of the groups there was Catholic of the whole convention. And at the, at the convention, was a, a man by the name of Reverend Jack Hayford, an excellent, excellent Pentecostal speaker, and is seen, Jack Hayford is seen as the man in Pentecostalism, in American Pentecostal, worldwide Pentecostalism. The man, a wonderful man. They gave him the main auditorium all three days. So all, every afternoon, there were, in the morning there were individual seminars, in the afternoon, he had the main auditorium all three days, and the title of his talk was the, the Seven Divine Signs of the Impending Divine Visitation. And what he talked about were seven things, seven works of God, one of whom was the, the, the revival that we're into, the other was work among Israel, the other was the increase of worship in the church, another was uh, the movement of God among men. Um, the other was the movement of God for, for racism, remove racism, the church is getting involved in that. And, and he noted seven different things. And he said this, he said, six years ago, none of these things existed. All of a sudden, he said, I look around and I see seven powerful streams flowing. And he said, my conclusion is, that these seven streams are looking forward to a divine visitation of this planet. Now, as I look at that, and I look also at what Marian apparitions are talking about, about a worldwide divine sign, okay, which everyone, which everyone will know and everyone will be given a chance. I'm trying to interpret the Marian apparitions the best I can, the best I understand them that the whole world will be given a chance, it will be a time of, of great decision, a time of a visitation. I'm seeing sort of, I'm seeing the same thing. Okay, now here's, here's the secret. We said that revival is the sweet and powerful presence of Jesus. What I believe is going to happen is, through, is there will be a visitation of Jesus to our earth. I'm not talking, I am not talking about the end of the world. I am talking about a special visitation of Jesus to this earth, which, in which Jesus is ready to touch every single person on this earth. He's ready to. But the churches have to know what's going on. That's the divine plan. As I look at some of their startling signs happening, even in the Muslim world, seemingly visions and apparitions of Jesus to Muslims, they always seem to happen when there are Christians nearby to whom the Muslims can go and find out what was this all about. Because the world, you know, the world doesn't understand the things of the Spirit. 
And even if Jesus came, the world wouldn't know what happened, right? I mean, you know, you'd have some, you'd have Shirley MacLaine or somebody on television uh, <laughs> talking about this is what happened. You know, you, you know what would happen, you know? You'd have CNN reporting it. Okay, here, here it is. And you'd have somebody up here, oh, this is what, this must be happening. And you know that, that Jesus could come to this planet in a very special way with a divine visitation and before you knew it there'd be a hundred different interpretations of well it's a UFO aliens have come to this planet okay everything the new agers would be out and say see this is what has happened you know, we told you all along okay so that it's not enough that God offer what we'll call I'll try to call an extraordinary grace an extraordinary sense of his presence it's not enough because the secular world is so secular, it wouldn't know what to do. It wouldn't even know what happened. It, it, it would be so, you know, the, the interpretation of this thing. Oh, so what God wants is he wants his church to know so that when there is the special gift of God that's going to be given to the whole world, that the church would say, sure, we know what that is. Not only that, come on over. And you'll experience it not just once, but you'll experience it every single day, every single night, every time we gather. Okay? So you can get a sense of the goal of revival. The goal of revival is that the churches come to understand the presence of Jesus and the, and the sweet presence of Jesus and the manifest presence of Jesus. And when Jesus shows up, it's electricity, right? I mean, when he comes, I mean, things start happening. I mean, a lot, okay, people, and when people get delivered, it's pretty messy, right? Sometimes, you know, it's pretty messy when people get delivered. Well, why is it messy? Jesus isn't messy, but what they've been into, they've been into drugs and they've been into everything else. They've been into pornography, and Jesus has to come and clean them out. You know, surgery is not, is not clean. You know, there's blood, there's blood all over the place when there's surgery, right? Okay? You don't go in, you won't go in to Dr. So-and-so and say, oh, doctor, you know, look at your surgery room. You've got blood all over this place. You can't be too good a physician. You, you know, you're becoming very divisive here in this hospital because you've got blood all over this place. And you know what we like in this hospital is a nice, clean, antiseptic hospital. Well, fine. Well, nobody's going to get better, though, because surgery is bloody. Okay? And things don't look right. And, and, and it's hard. You know, you look, if you ever walked into a surgery room, you'd say, oh, my God. And the surgeon said, wait a minute, everything's going wonderful. I'm going to sew him up in a minute, and he'll going to be fine. Give him five more days. HM, his, his HMO, only give him five days, but we'll give him five days in the hospital. <laughs> okay, he'll be okay. Okay? Okay? But, but someone who isn't used to it would say, wow, this poor man. Okay? So that's why God has to get us used to the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And he has to get the churches used to the work of the Holy Spirit so that when the Holy Spirit starts acting out there, the freaky interpretations that are going to fly around, we can say that's not what happened. We know exactly what happened. Come on in, join our church, okay? And that's where the fish start jumping into the boat, okay? Right. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. These sessions have been wonderful. <laughs> uh, the, the, when, I, we come, when the Lord gave us the conference, there was a certain idea of what we would do and the, the idea has really come to pass in the sense that the morning sessions we could minister to those who are out of town give them the basic teachings have be you know uh, size enough that we can sort of pray over you enough and have you lose a little hair with all the laying on the hands and then the evening sessions are just great big sessions as we've had every evening where the the regular members of the prayer group from the oh, yeah, Philadelphia yeah, and the other areas can join us so what we want to do now is just complete the anointing okay, just so let the anointing so just just take the anointing just take the anointing now. take the anointing just take the anointing just take the anointing. Just take, the anointing. Just take the anointing now take the anointing now just receive just receive just receive now just receive the Holy Spirit brother Panky taught us that you can't pour water into the bottle if the water is trying to come out of the bottle a wonderful teaching. So when you're, getting, when you're getting prayed over for the anointing, just be still. You don't have to pray. You don't have to do anything. Just receive. Now, I want you just to receive. Just take the anointing. This is, this is the moment that's special for you. That's why we made these morning conferences. They're really special for you. Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus.
concerning the tapes, just stop off at the, at the bookstore. God bless. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.